So what we're going to talk about tonight is, as, as Denise said, and Denise, thank you for that introduction. Um, and one of the things I will say for both Craig and I, uh, as part of this, not only with all that Denise was mentioning, but we both have children who are in college. In the case of Craig, he has another one who will be applying. I just had one that graduated. So believe me, we've been through this and this is something that we're dealing with on a yearly basis. But the idea and the premise of this and what we call this is it's not how to save for college anymore. It's how to save on the cost of college. Uh, most of the time when we're having these conversations, we're having them with either students or the parents of students who are usually juniors or seniors in high school. And let's face it, you're not going to be able to save for the, that college expense by the time the child's in high school. So now it's what can we do to sort of trim that or lower the cost of college? So the basically we'll go through a little bit about, you know, the college landscape and what that looks like. Um, some of the different dilemmas that face most parents of students in terms of what they're trying to do. We'll cover some of the basics, and then we'll go through some of the tips and some of the strategies on how to reduce the cost. And it, at the last part of it, we will give you some admission tips, ways to you know en enhance, entice, uh, you know, get you sort of to the school that you're looking for, uh, and not land you in jail as far as the other admission scandals that went on right with that. So. We're going to start here, and this is FAFSA, and FAFSA stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And normally, Craig and I don't start this presentation with FAFSA, but the only reason we're, we're mentioning it, and we will bring it up later in the presentation, we'll go through some of the, the parts to that in the landscape and filling it out and those type of things. But the reason we're starting with it is because of where we are in the calendar year. So understand all financial aid is governed by this form, this FAFSA, which is again, the free application for federal student aid. It is a needs-based program, but that needs-based program, you have to think of it almost like, and forgive Craig and I, right? Craig, our, our visual for everyone is buckets, yes. right? We use buckets of money. Not pools, not bags, not silos, whatever your visual is you want to use, but we use buckets. So you have to think of this as every school has a bucket of money that they are able to give for financial aid, and it's on a first come, first serve basis. It is a needs based approach, but that needs based is first come, first serve. The window for FAFSA opened on October 1st. So if you are the a student or the parent of a student who's going to be attending school, college, higher education in the fall of 2022, your time to file FAFSA is now. That's the why we're bringing it up right now, because this is the time. If you've got a student who's a junior, then obviously you've got to do that next year. Your deadline, the window, not deadline, but the window opens on October 1st every year. And we'll talk about some of the steps in going through FAFSA, but you want to make sure that you file it. And if you haven't done it yet, start to get that in process put in place, because like we said, it's on a first come first serve basis. Craig, anything with FAFSA that you want to add? I mean, we'll talk about it a little while, but you're going through it too, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest thing that stops people from getting involved in FAFSA is, you know, it's complicated. And so it's another headache thing you got to get through. Um, but the, the, this is one thing you don't want to, you know, I'm a big procrastinator myself sometimes. And uh, this is one thing you don't want to be procrastinating on. Like I said, you can't cut somebody else in line. You get either lined up for the tickets or you're not, right? Uh, exactly. Yeah, it's a great way to put it, right? Like I said, it's it's you, you just get put in line, and if you're the needs based, then you get you get you get awarded. And if you're wait at the back of the line and the bucket runs out of money, you're not going to get anything. Yeah, so Craig mentions that, like, not only does his wife, but I also did chime in on him, like, hey, I got my fast but fun. Have you done it yet? Did you do yours? Have you done yours yet? You know, so it's something that you've got to be thinking about and doing, right? So the current cost of, of college, I, you know, this is the top concern for parents right now, really, right? What are those top concerns, right? Well, you know, death. everybody worries about dying, you know, you know that you're not going to see your child grow up and to become a, a mature 
adult, you know, that is that is a concern. Saving for retirement is is absolutely the number one concern or not having enough money in retirement. The pandemic has certainly put job security in everybody's mind. And then there's paying for college, right? That's one of those things that's it's there and it's there from when the child is born, right? You start thinking about it, but then as the child gets into their teen years, you start freaking out about it, about, wait a minute, I don't have money set aside for education. And this is just an average. We're giving you average cost for a college or university, public university across the country. That average right now is $22,000 a year. The average cost now for a private college or university is over $50,000. That's the average cost across the country. And when my mother paid that much for our childhood home. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> when you look at that, you know, so just doing that out, that's four years, that, that public college, that cost is $88,000. That private institution, that's 200000 north of $200,000 for that private institution. And there are over 250, actually, that, that number is closer to about 275 now. That, that's because that was as of last year that charge over $50,000 a year for tu- for everything. That's room board, tuition, everything. That's more than I paid for my first home. Yeah. <laughs> my first here's, home. here's one of the drivers that come with this, right? One of the things to be thinking about is that of the freshmen who are enrolled this year, so this past fall that just enrolled, only 53% of them are going to graduate within six years. So this is, and we're going to have this conversation, it's going to come up later in the presentation where we're going to talk about sort of this collaboration effort between whether you're on this call as the parent or whether you're on this call as a student and making sure that the choice you make is the right choice, because that's usually what happens is that the school is not the right fit. And the, the child, the student ends up not matriculating through for the four years because it was a wrong choice. But we'll talk about that later. But I understand these costs are just for one. I mean, like, you know, Craig's situation next year, he's going to have two and they're going to be in school. So, you know, that's that's one of those factors. I happen to be a planner just the way it works for me. My kids happen to go four years the, the older one graduated and the younger one graduated high school. So it's it's eight straight years for me of payments, basically. I don't have a double dip in a single year. All right. So that that savings versus versus college, right? And and this is really comes down to, you know, parents have this this sort of competing emotion, right? Craig, we run into this all this time with with parents who are, I, I've got to save for my retirement, but I want to save for the child's education at the same time. Oh, absolutely. Um, it, it's and sometimes I've seen parents um, you know sacrifice their retirement or a large portion of it to fund college. Um, and we'll probably go into some of that a little later on too. Right, and that's one of the things. So one of the things, just as a mindset thought for you with this, you know, that Craig and I is not, you know, really, really try to expound to everybody. When you think of this, think I'm financing the education, I'm funding the retirement. Because the last thing you want to have happen is that, yes, you've got the kid through school. That's tremendous. But if there's nothing in retirement, then what are you going to do now? So parents, you've got to be thinking about this. There are ways, and I understand student debt and what's happening. We're going to talk about that. But really, when it comes down to it, it's think financing the education, funding the retirement. But one of the things is don't lose hope. Right. So there are ways, there are strategies, there are some tips and tricks that you can use to save, you know, not just for college, but on the cost of college and just realize that this is not a one size fits all for everybody. Right. It's it's understanding what goes through this, how it works, what's being asked of you, what's not being asked of you, the you know, what I don't have to disclose or tell exists out there. 
and how you can deal with that. Right? Where Craig and I, like we'd like to say it is the legal, ethical, and moral way to get away with paying less for the education or in the case of the US government on your taxes, because there are loopholes that are available to everyone. All right, so covering the basics. We're gonna start with the EFC, that's the expected family contribution. And just understand that every institute, every college, every university is going to calculate an EFC for you. That's what the expected family contribution, what your family is going to have to pay for the cost of the college. It may not be the total cost, we're gonna go through that, but it's the expected family contributions, right? That's done through FAFSA, as I said in the beginning, and we're going to touch on it again in a little while. All of the financial aid awards starts with the FAFSA form, right? The CSS profile, right? That's the, the college scholarship services uh, form. A lot of private institutions, because they're not held to public uh, guidelines, can ask you more details, Craig, right? That's where they get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty about what you have and what you've got type of thing. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't go on FASFA necessarily where CSS can ask, like they don't ask you about your retirement accounts. They don't ask you about, you know, you know they, I mean, they do ask you about outside investments, but, you know, they don't ask you about property holding. I mean, there's a lot of things they, you know, things they don't get into where CSS because it's a private institution, they'll ask you all your funding sources, all the money that you have. Right. Yeah, so just understand that some of that will come in that you may not have it or need it on the FAFSA form, but then the CSS form, if you're, if you're also applying to a private institution, a lot of times they're gonna ask you for it. And we'll come back to this later when we talk about knowing what forms are needed and, and when to file in terms of dealing with that. You know, what happened? Oh, there it is. I knew there was a FAFSA that was going to come up in terms of dealing with it. So, um, all right. So understand how financial aid is determined, right? So you've got the sticker price for the college. Whatever the college is, you've got the cost to attend, your tuition, books, room and board, everything that goes along with it. What you're going to minus from that is what they consider the EFC, the family contribution. And that is usually they're looking at the parent's income, there's a formula for it, the student's income, if the student has income, if the student is independent married and has a spouse, then they will take the student's spouse into that equation. But that's generally what they're doing when they're trying to figure out what the cost is going to be. And I'll go through an example in a second with you, but so you have the sticker price, you minus your expected family contribution, and that gets you what's missing, right? What the need for, for aid or for filling the gap in to attending that school is going to be. So an example of that, and just taking a look at it, right? So let's say we've got two different choices. One is a public, you know, a state university, and one of them is a private school, private institution. The state institution, the cost to attend, like I said, the average is 22,000. In this case, the, the public college is slightly more expensive. It's at 60,000. <laughs> slightly. <laughs> well, I mean, no, the average is 50, remember. Only three times as much. That's slightly more. Well, that, no, 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 no. This, the, then the, the private institution, a private, the average cost of a private college is $50,000. Okay. Right? So that's just, <laughs> don't go, you look at these. He's giving me grief in this. All right. So then the, the, saying what the other people who are muted are saying, oh my God, slightly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> However, the expected family contribution, right? In both cases, because they're calculated the same in terms of what the EFC number is going to be, is $15,000. That's what the family is going to be expected to be able to contribute for the educational cost. So if I do it out, the sticker price, 22,000 minus 15 equals the 7,000 is what's necessary. And in the case of the private, that would be 60 minus 15 equals 45,000. Looking at these two numbers, you're thinking, oh, well, it's going to be much less expensive if I go to the private institute, to the public institution versus the private. 
may not necessarily be the case. See, because this is just a starting point. Now we have to look at what financial aid or financial awards may be awarded to you through your filing and eligibility and needs-based guidelines. And if we do it out and we look at that public institution, well, they're going to give you Stafford loans. Those are the federal student, the subsidized student loans. They amount to about $5,500 for a year. So if we did out this example, the $22,000 sticker price, the EFC was 15, that means there was 7,000 of a gap, but I can file and get FAFSA and they're gonna give me Stafford loans for a subsidy, which gives me about 5,500, but there's still 1,500 missing. I gotta come up with 1,500. And this is where some of that, Craig, that conversation about student debt comes in because now I've got to go get either private loan or come up with $1,500 for this one year of school, mm -hmm. which means that the actual cost, instead of being 15,000, was 16,500 to go to this public institution, okay? Mm -hmm. However, in applying to that private institution that costs 60,000 with my EFC of 15, because they are able to award me different types of grants and scholarships, they cover the whole thing. So I could wind up in a situation where it ends up being less expensive on a cost basis to me as the family to apply to this private institution versus the public institution, even though the sticker is much less. Ends up costing $1,500 less because they've got the money, right? The, the private, it's a state like UMass. I'll just use UMass as an example. UMass isn't going to really give anybody any type of, of financial aid or award other than maybe like the Stafford loan, just because they have the ability to do it. There is a private institution, right? They've got to compete against that lower price school. They're looking for the same students. They've got the money, which means they make the rules. And I know, Craig, you ran into something similar with this. I mean, I had experience. My older daughter went to Syracuse, and Craig's older daughter is... Roger Williams. Or I was going to say Roger Williams. I knew it was in Rhode Island, so I was close. <laughs> but, but, I'm but, honest, it's in Rhode Island. Yes. <laughs> But, but what, what, what happens is that sometimes that they will be able to grant you um, eligibility scholarships, not merit scholarships. We'll talk about those in a little bit. But there is a way that, that to offset this versus the state institution, you know, the state college or state university is probably not going to be able to give you any type of grant or financial award other than like the Stafford loans or, or some sort of subsidized federal loan. And don't forget about Pell Grants too. Right, but Pell Grants fall under that, right? So they fall under that, that's under that financial award. More think, than likely the state is not gonna be able to do that. Okay. The private institution would, but the, the state's probably not going to be able to, maybe. Right, so let's talk about trying to reduce the cost, right? That's what this is all about. We got you to this point here. So, you know, the first thing is, and, and for us, it's always about free money, right? You know, free money is the best kind of money. So that's what we always want to look at. Now you have merit-based scholarships. And one of the things with this is, you know, if you're, again, a senior, even a junior, you should be looking at scholarships that are available you know, different avenues for that, whether it's through the school, whether it's through associations in the town and so on. Craig, you know, in terms of, you know, I know your daughter's probably going through that in terms of looking at all the different places. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we're actually traveling again in a couple of weeks. To yeah. See a couple more schools. <laughs> right. All the tours. <laughs> exactly, you know, and going through that. And so, you, you know, merit-based scholarships, I, it's something that everybody should spend a little time, do a little bit of research on to see what you can come up with. Uh, Need-based financial aid, again, that's coming from the school itself. More than likely, you're going to have more success with this at a private institution that has more money to give away than a state college to do that. Craig mentioned the Pell Grants, right, which are also could be available in a need-based situation. 
cheap money, those are the, the Stafford loans, the federal student loans. Uh, again, the only way they come available is by filing FAFSA. And we'll talk about that when we get into filing FAFSA, but that's one of the reasons for filing the FAFSA form is that you have access to federal subsidized loans. And then you've got the gap, you gotta fill it in yourself, right? And whether that's you've already put money away in some way, shape or form, or you're taking out a loan instead of a private loan, whether that's a home equity on the property, in this case, it shows the, the plus loans, those are the parent loans, um, which do have some benefit that, that, you know, we can talk about that at another time. Uh, and then the other is if there's family members and third party to get to. We'll talk about how family members can get involved and how they can mess things up in some cases versus help when we're dealing with that. You also may want to mention work study too that comes in the part of the package as well. Yes. Especially when you're doing FASB, you got to check off and be interested in work study. And that's kind of nice because it's, you know, it's really easy jobs for your kids on campus that can help pay for school costs. Right. Yep. Also another way to do it. Absolutely. You know, so any of the things that you can do like that, and that's in filling out the FAFSA form to go through it. You know, so just realize that any of these that are going to increase your financial aid eligibility, which we'll talk about a little bit more, right, it's going to reduce your cost. It's going to reduce the gap that might be there and the need for any debt financing. You know, student loan debt right now is is crippling. The number 2021 current student loan debt is one point seven trillion. That's with a capital T trillion dollars in student debt that's out there right now. So anything you can do to to offset that or not have it, tremendous, you know. And we'll we'll talk a little bit more on that. Before you move forward, I do have a question from our audience. Sure. It says if someone has a learning disability that might keep them from having a very high GPA, can they still get a merit scholarship that might take into account their disability? So uh, merit scholarships, possibly, you know, certainly some other type of scholarships. There are other organizations that will try to do scholarships for those who are who are uh, challenged and not have the higher GPA. Uh, that's why we're saying that you can look around for other organizations to see if there are um, different types of scholarships available. I call them merit. They do, basically, a merit scholarship to us is just anything that's not being given as a financial award by the institution itself. So, Sometimes I look at merit scholarships based on the need of the client, I mean, the, the, um, the student. And they also will look at not just grades, but they look at what are you contributing? Are you doing a lot of public service? Is there, you know, are you involved in your school in different ways? So there can be lots of reasons um, that they justify giving somebody a merit scholarship. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it doesn't just have to be grade scores is, is what that's about. Just realize, I understand the terminology there with merit sort of get, alludes to that, but there are different levels and, and scholarships out there. There are lots and lots and lots of scholarships out there. So you need to spend a little time and do a little research on that. And, and really, it's even if it's just a couple of hundred dollars, it's worth having that. And my older daughter's GPA going into college was a little shy of three, <laughs> and she still got the merit scholarship. So, um, but she was involved in lots of activities, and so right. that will help. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that. That's one of the things that comes up later on. We're going to talk. You know, so one of the things with this is is one of the parts to FAFSA is it's tied to your tax returns. What used to happen in the old days, this is from somebody who's been doing this for a long time, is you had to go through and literally manually upload, you know, basically go through your tax return and manually fill out FAFSA. Nowadays, it's a push button. It's tied to the IRS. So long as you have filed your tax return for the previous year, it's literally a push a button and they'll sync your tax return into your FAFSA form and you don't have to spend the time with it. Same thing if your child is working and has had an income filed a, a you know a 1040 EZ, the same thing, just push a button, it links it and you're done with it. I mean, that's the nicest thing for me dealing with FAFSA that I found from previous trying to help clients go through the manual process of the whole thing. Well, when you're doing two of them, it's even better because it just links to the next one. Right, you exactly. Don't have to draw it in again, you just do it right through. 
but to understand that it's tied to your tax return. So, you know, for right now, we were in the, the, the filing season. It was last year's taxes. What you need to be thinking about and being proactive is what is my tax return for next year going to look like? I'm going to be filing that in, you know, the, the spring of 2022. And that's going to be for next, not for this filing. The following, right. Right. It's going to be for the following one. So it's all you just always realize that you're using last year's tax return to push for next year. So the 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 fast reform I just filled out, it took my 2020 tax filing for the 2022 tax year, the student's tax year, the student's filing year, basically. So just understand, but you don't have to worry about it because like I said, it's all linked in. But what you need to be thinking about is what you've got on your tax return, right? What it says. And, you know, know all the forms that are necessary. So filling out the FAFSA form. If you're filing to a private institution, you got to have that CSS form, right? Are there other forms that they're asking you to complete? Usually each school will give you a to-do list. Here's what's missing. Here's what you need to update. Here's what needs to be done. We'll talk about that when we get to some tips and tricks and ideas with being organized. Or for the EFC, when you're filling out FAFSA, as Craig mentioned, there are some forms, there are some items they're not going to ask you for. Your, your retirement accounts. So if IRAs, 401ks, they're not going to ask you for that. They are going to ask you if you have not your uh, home property, but if you have other property, whether it's rental or vacation, other property counts against you on your FAFSA. Now, one thing when you get to CSS, equity in your property, they're going to ask you about that. So it's private institutions, they want to get you with your equity. So just understand, FAFSA won't ask you about equity in your home, but they will ask you about equity if you have second property, whether it's rental or not. If you got rental income, what you're getting for that rental income on another property, or if it's just a vacation home, they still want to know what the equity in that is. But it, not FAFSA is not going to ask you about your home equity or your retirement accounts. So two places where money can go. And, you know, realize that, that by doing that, you can offset some of what could be considered uh, assets against you or income against you that you're now pushing off. So it's just looking at, again, legal, ethical, and moral ways to sort of lower the cost and, and applying for education. Well, the other misnomer too, Tom, is a lot of people say, I'm not even going to bother. I make too much money. I'm not going to get any aid. You're jumping ahead on me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll come back to you with that. Hold that thought, okay? okay. I'm, going to come, I, I'm going to come back to that because that is one of the things that comes up when we go through this, right? And one I, I sorry, I didn't mean to admonish Craig there, but one of the things I will admonish him on is, is just the whole, uh, only the government makes money. Everybody else earns it. Government makes it, they print it, everybody else earns money. Oh my goodness gracious. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what not to do. Right. So this is this is the conversation we're about, about, you know, ask, you know, gifting or, you know, uh, Nana or grandpa wants to get involved and they want to gift the child some money for uh, education purposes. Right. The problem is money in the child's name counts more against financial aid than anything else. So money should never be gifted, should never be put in the child's name. That's that's the first thing, okay? Because that's it's kind of like 35 cents of every dollar counts against financial aid, where it's five cents of every dollar that's in the parent's name. Money that's in grandma or grandpa's name doesn't count about anything. So Nana and grandpa should hold on to their money until after you have filed the FAFSA and, and applied for and been accepted to college, because then that way you can hold off, right? You can wait. Better would be to then gift it afterwards or maybe wait, just let it save up. And then when you graduate, give it to you as a gift or start if you had to take on a, you know, a Stafford loan or some sort of, of financing debt, have them then take care of that. 
but money that's in grandma and grandpa's name, we're going to talk about this when we get to 529s, never counts against you. All right. So the more you know, the less you pay, right? So this is just a quick one, just, just going through an example with this. Like, so let's say we're dealing with somebody and you know, they've, they're, they're married, they're finally jointly, they've got some assets, they've got money, but they're not making any contributions to retirement accounts. Their 401ks or whatever, in this case, they're talking about their 401k accounts. And so they're, gross income is is at a higher level whereas if they both turned around in this particular year in 2021 if you are turning 50 or over the age of 50 the maximum you can contribute to a 401k account if you have that available through your employer is twenty six thousand dollars so as a couple if you're both doing that you could have fifty two thousand dollars that you could put into your retirement account which will then drop your adjusted gross income and also be a non-countable asset when it comes to applying for financial aid uh, simplified EFC that's on the screen there. Simplified EFC is a number that's it's basically when you get below a certain threshold that they, you know, as far as the income is, is adjusted income level, then you go into a simplified EFC and there's actually some levels where you have no EFC whatsoever, but those are different. That's as you go through the, the calculate and figure it out, you can go through that. But there are ways to bring that down. This is just one way where it says, you know, use the ability to contribute to your retirement account in the year where you're going to be applying for financial aid because you've lowered your income. The other, Craig, is people always ask us about hiding money, right? I got, I got money in the bank. I want to hide the money. What do I do with that? I don't, you know, where do I put it? You know, well, again, ethically, legally, morally, places you could do it. Let's say you have outstanding debt. Well, what if you use it to pay off some of that debt? Take that out of the bank. It's no longer there, right? Pay down your debt. You free up money that, you know, your cash flow, but your cash flow may not, is not going to really count against you in terms of that. So there are ways to position assets in that case. The other less nefarious way to do it is uh, you can also, cash values and in life insurance policies are not included on FASFA. That's and true. Sure. We'll get to the we'll get to some of those that come up, but that's one that's not there. So I'm glad you brought that up, right? So, so yeah, I mean that's that's you know we're getting a little into the gray area, let's call it, in terms of dealing with that. So not don't know that that's necessarily uh, the place that's necessary to go with it, um, but it is you know if there is a need, if it's there, and there is the possibility a way to do that where you have some policy that allow you to put the money in and then maybe take it back without any surrender or penalty charges, you know, after a certain time period, you know, there's another way to do it. Right. But you can save money, right? And if you were doing this through the four years where you, so that's another thing with FAFSA that I didn't mention before, that FAFSA form gets filed every year. So even though you, you may have done it in the first year and gotten qualified for something, window opens next year, you got to do it again. You got to do it every year, the child that you are applying for financial aid, every year that FAFSA has to be done. And if you're taking nothing else from what we're telling you this evening, you should be notating on your calendar that October 1st, the window is open and I've got to apply and do my FAFSA form sometime. And I usually like to do it, have it done by that first weekend. So that's just me. I'm usually by the fifth or sixth, I'm done with FAFSA. But certainly by now, you know, we want to make sure that you're getting it done and getting it in place. All right. So, you know, if, if we're dealing with, and we generally don't know the audience in terms of who's there. So we talk about different things, but we like to use high income families as an example, because generally, like Craig was saying, they're just thinking, I wouldn't qualify for anything. I earn too much money. Right. And so maybe all they're relying on is merit-based scholarships or some tuition discounts. 
but they're not really thinking about what else they could be doing. And, you know, the more you know, the more you're able to do, and certainly the more you're able to take advantage of, again, you're going to lower those out of pocket costs for the annual tuition fee, the, the cost of college. This one gets a little crazy because there's a lot of words on the screen in terms of dealing with this, but it just, it's really about, you know, if you have somebody that you're working with or have somebody you know or sitting down with somebody that you can really start to, to go through and understand all the different pieces and how this all connects and how everything sort of works together with trying to lower those costs. We're going to talk about some of the other strategies in a second with FASFA, but that just sort of gives you the, the, the overall criteria there of, gee, there's so many different pieces and so many moving parts to this that, as Craig said, that a lot of times it just becomes overwhelming and people don't even want to go through with it. Mm -hmm. All right. So a better strategy might be that instead of just, you know, hey, I'm, 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 cut, I'm cutting the check, I'm going to pay for this. Right. Well, if your child is a dependent, maybe it's now the child is 18, 19 years old. Maybe it's now the child's an independent. So let's make the child an independent. I can I can give my child the, the money for there, gift it to them. There's no tax consequence on it. If any money that they have as an independent, they now have a standard deduction just like everybody else, which is like 10, 12,000. What was it? Huh? Uh, fourteen five, I believe, this year. For an individual? Mm -hmm. Wow. Boy, I was lost on that. Oh, you just did it. That's why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. So fourteen five. I mean, that's a big number, right? As 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 far as that's concerned. Um, but that that's the standard deduction. So if you're giving them fourteen five, then they had no other income, and that would be zero in terms of taxes, right? And even if you go over that, but one of the things for certainly a lot of families that they get uh, X'd out of is that education tax credit. And after a certain limit, after a certain amount of income, you no longer qualify for the education tax, which is 2,500, that, that tax credit. And one of the things is if your child is now an independent, doesn't have that income, isn't in that same bracket, they're going to get that $2,500 tax bracket, tax credit. So that's as much as $10,000. Over four years. Okay. Right. right. You know, and, and that's the thing. We were talking about high income earners, high families, right? But one of the things that they end up doing is they're just writing a check for it. But, you know, one of the things to be thinking about is there are some ways to do this where I'm just doing something that's, again, legal, ethical, and moral, morally available for me to lower it. And all I'm doing is making my child an independent versus claiming them as a dependent now on my tax return. And now I'm giving them the money and then they're dealing with it. And they're more than likely going to qualify for the education tax credit and the standard deduction and probably not have really any tax that's going to come from that. All right, so the objectives, you want funds for college, we're trying to save for retirement, we want a minimum impact on my cash flow, and you know, is there some flexibility? And we're gonna talk about you know, some of the places where the money can sit. And this is what Craig was alluding to and talking about, you know, where can you park the money as far as trying to move it outside of things? And again, I know a little bit of a headache here in terms of reading this screen. I uh, just understand green is good, red is bad. And when you look across on those, I don't know if you can see them. I can't do anything with it because it's in the, <laughs> it's going to try to play with that, which would screw the whole thing up. Uh, but if you, if you go down on the, under the vehicle, the third one down is 529 accounts. So for the audience, in case you aren't aware of the 529 college savings plan, most families with a child probably has one set up. This is a tax deferred vehicle. Now here in Massachusetts, it is now a pre-tax, a tax actually break vehicle. As of 2017, Massachusetts put it in place that $1,000 per parent for child. So if it's two parents, that's $2,000 per child. 
can be contributed to a 529 and you get a state tax break on that money. It's supposed to end this year in Massachusetts. We'll see what happens with next year, but that's right now the standard for 529. 529s, just understand those are assets that are in the parent's name. If we have students on the line, you know, versus parents, students, you're the beneficiary. It doesn't count against you. Parents, it's in your name. That's better than having it in your student in the in the student's name. It does still count against you, though. It is an asset that does count against you. So, you know, it, it's there. You can use it for financial aid. It's there's certainly um, a good vehicle to have in place for that. But there are some others. The first one on the line there is the Coverdale Savings Account. That's the old education IRA accounts. And then, as Craig mentioned, one of the only other ones that's in there that's a green box that does not count against financial aid is retirement accounts, because FAFSA will now look at that. The one on the bottom is fixed annuities. And an annuity, because FAFSA, the, the financial uh, aid, looks at an annuity as, as a similar to a retirement account, because it's tax deferred and there's limited to get access to it. But these are just different vehicles and what they can do. The idea is trying to find what's the right fit for every family. Everybody's different. Everybody has different things they need, different needs, different places that they want to try to do it. But understanding that how each of these impact your EFC and impact the application, uh, it, it, it comes all together to say, gee, it makes sense. And like Craig mentioned, that the life insurance isn't even on the chart in terms of, that's what I was saying to you, Craig, it's not on here in terms of dealing with that because it's not something that people think about. It's not one of those, wait, I could do this and, and, and then I don't have to think about that. And the money's now not in the financial aid picture at all. Well, that's why we're here because most people don't think about any things on this chart. <laughs> right. Right. I do have a question from our audience, though, because someone is sure. thinking, um, what if my parents don't make a lot of money but earn a comfortable living? They fall on the income level where they don't have much money to send me to college, but, but not enough to use 401ks, et cetera, to reduce their income on paper. Well, so, more than like, so more than likely, they are going to fall into that simplified EFC, which means that the EFC, when that calculation comes in, is there's not going to be a lot expected from the family contribution portion. So if we're looking at the example that the public university one where it was 22,000, in that case, the expected family contribution may only be two or 3,000. And so the conversation is going to be what can possibly either the state or another institution do to make that up because there is absolutely the need for financial aid there. Well, I mean, the other thing, too, once again, I think people underestimate, I think that financial aid is only for people who fall into the you know, poverty category. And that's not true. Right. It's middle class gets a, in, in lower middle class get a lot of financial aid. Right. The other thing is what you were talking about is if the child um you know becomes emancipated or independent then they, you know, they're not counting the parents income anymore so so there's you know lots and lots of different strategies for everybody to find a way to get through right and that's the other thing as craig just mentioned if you were to then filing as an independent right you would more than likely you're going to to have little to no efc expected family contribution and you're probably going to qualify for the the tax credit on top of it so there's going to be ways to to deal with that you know 529 saving plan are, are good but not necessarily the end all be all for everyone it's just one of the things with it. it's 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 unfortunately has become this this you know go to that's where i've got to have a 529 not necessarily work for every family everybody's different everybody has different circumstances different situations so just know it's there but it's only one of the tools in the whole toolbox that you can use for this that can, can be an effective way to sort of lower those costs. And not to slide us off into a tangent, uh, my friend, but the 529, because we are dealing with families who sometimes have child with, with special needs, um, what can you do with a 529 that you can't do with any of those other options? 
Here we go. Thank you. So one of the things that Craig is referring to is you do have what are known now as, as ABLE accounts 529A, right? So ABLE accounts. And if you have put money into a 529 and the, the student, the child is not using that money, is not going to go on to further education or, or does not have the need to use it, that money can then be transferred, the 529 can be transferred to a 529 ABLE, when A uh, account without any penalties, taxes or anything. It's a, it's a free move basically. So for parents with younger children, not sure what's the direction the child's gonna go, we always suggest open the 529, get at least the $2,000 discount. And then later on, you can see, you know, if a child ends up going to college and going to go that route, terrific. But it doesn't, you can then move the, the, to a 529 ABLE. And a question from the audience. Uh, if you get some scholarships in a particular year, does it affect your aid for the upcoming years? No, scholarships will not affect aid. And they're annual anyway, right? Right. Yeah, they'll ask you, but it's not going to affect the aid, right? That's they're going to ask you, hey, did you get one? You know, and it, we're, 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 you also ask about if you had any grants or anything like that that you were given. And you just want to make them aware. And more than likely, they'll do it on that, that regular basis with it. So possibly mistakes to be avoided, right? So understand, we've talked about the process is somewhat overwhelming. It's a little bit crazy in terms of dealing with everything. And there are mistakes that do get made on a regular basis with this. And, you know, one of those things with dealing with this is understanding the application process itself. The number one there that's, that's the, the, the highlight, the, the sort of, you know, choosing the wrong school or curriculum. When I mentioned before about 53% of freshmen is the, the graduation rate, you know, it's because of that. It's because you either, the, the student picked the school they didn't mesh with, right? They weren't comfortable there. They didn't, it didn't work out for them. They needed to then transfer and then that didn't go well. Or they picked a, a, a subject that they weren't really that interested in and it didn't hold their attention. And, and you know, you just, you wandered off basically is, is what happens. And so you really need to spend time and this is to both the parents and the students. We're gonna talk about this in, in the tips and tricks in a little bit, but it's the same conversation. You really need to have this be a collaborative effort. You need to have a conversation and be real with both the students' expectations, the parents' expectations, and what that is all going to mean. We're gonna go through the lost financial aid, the mistakes in a second. We're gonna talk about that. You know, and then how do I fill in the gap? What do I do? We, you know, if we, we only it's like that, the, the question that came from the audience, well, if the if the school price is twenty two thousand, the expected family contribution is two thousand, that's twenty thousand. If I'm only getting Stafford loans that are only going to amount to maybe you know seventy five hundred, where's the other twelve five gonna come from? Well, that's going to be a student loan. I'm going to have to now find a way to get a student loan. And how can I do that? Or in the case with parents, they can take out a plus loan. That's the parent loan. And there are some benefits to a parent loan versus a student loan that come from the worst case scenarios, i.e. death or disability to the parent. Yeah, I do have a question, Tom, and, and, and I, I'm going to caution us not to uh, let this hijack our, uh, our presentation here, but what can a 529 be used to pay for? So the 529 has been liberally expanded to what it can pay for. When I say that, I mean, you know, tuition, books. Oh, I'm sorry, 529A, the ABLE Act. What can ABLE pay oh, for? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you just said 529. That's why I said it wouldn't let a hijack it. I'm sorry, uh, 529 so, uh, so an ABLE account is, is basically anything that is that falls under what is known as a QDE, a qualifying disability expense. That can be a, a pretty much a myriad of services, anything from housing, food, uh, general upkeep, transportation, you know, uh, uh, 
medical assisted technologies, pretty much anything that falls under uh, daily living and or other expenses for the benefit of the individual. But you can look them up. It's called QDE, that's Qualifying Disability Expenses. Thank you. Yeah, no, 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 not a problem. Love the question. All right, so there we are. So one of the mistakes, the number one mistake, because Craig mentioned it earlier, and I'm going to let you sort of take it from here because you said that, and it's that a family thinks I make too much money. In this case, I earn too much because I even did the mistake myself. I'm not going to file. Right. I'll take that. And then you can look at the chat and that, that next question is coming up. <laughs> oh, no, you can't. Okay. I'll be that. Can't. Yeah. Okay. Mistakes. I learned too. I earn too much money. So once again, this is a big thing that people get concerned about. And I've seen people just not even bother doing the FASVA um, or even applying for grants or scholarships, right? Because they just think they're not going to get them because they earn too much. The worst case scenario and is in any type of time when you ask for something is, is they're going to tell you no, right? The issue is going to be on, you know, how early you get in line, how much is available for aid. And what, what you qualify, you know, what, what your family is going to qualify for. As Tom said, you know, you may earn too much, but if you decide to let, you know, your child claim themselves, uh, you know, then well, the child may not. And so all of a sudden now you're eligible again. Um, so you should never make that assumption. Sometimes it's just a way of saying, well, I was, didn't want to tell you, I didn't feel like doing fast. Yeah. <laughs> it's too complicated. I didn't want to walk through it. Um, but you should always, 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 um, you know, make the effort. Absolutely. Right. So two and three is not understanding the formulas. Like I said, this is the, the ethically, legal and moral way that we can hide either our income or our assets without, you know, getting into trouble or, or you know, putting ourselves in jail with the rest of the admission scandals people in terms of going through that. And number three there, it says picking the wrong school. Like I said, that that just creates longer and more frustration on everybody's part. I will tell you, number four is applying to really six or fewer schools. Because what you want to do is the number really about the sweet spot is like 10. So you want to apply to about 10 schools because it's going to give you a broader base. And we'll talk about this with, with, with some of the tips and tricks, but it's going to give you that, that more, uh, as Craig said, you know, schools are all different in terms of it. So it's going to give you that, that, that more of a base to see what different packages are being available versus a shorter window, you know, less schools, you're, you're going to get a tighter window. And, and to that end, real, if, thinking that all the schools are going to be the same and what they give you for it. I have a couple of questions coming up here. Okay. Um, and I'll try to, you know, one's a, little, a few questions in one. If a family's EFC is very low, but a student has a savings account that is designated for college, but not a 529 savings plan, where would you recommend the student put the money to get it out of the bank? You mean so it won't be looked at for FASFA? Um, that gets tricky there, right? We talked yeah, about now, now, we, now we're getting in a little bit on the gray of it's no longer ethically immoral in terms of dealing with that. So, so here's the thing. The money that's already in the student's name, it's in the student's name, right? I mean, you know, what? the one thing you could do with it is, yes, you could have uh, the child take the money if it's designated for it, open a 529, for the child and have the contribution made into the 529 because that's no longer in the child's name. The child is the beneficiary, but it's open through either a parent or somebody else and the, the, anybody can contribute to a 529. You know, little little side tip and trick there, right? So Nana and grandpa can open a 529 and make the child a beneficiary. They're never gonna look at that. They're never going to know that that account exists because it's under Nana or Grandpa's name. It's not under the, the either the parent or the student's name. So um, that's one way you could do it where the funds are then, you know, technically going. But you'd want to do it before you had to file FAFSA. So and again, that's with the year that you're doing it. So. If you're going to be filing the FAFSA in October of 2022 for the October 2023 year, you'd want to do it between now and the end of the year. Correct. Because otherwise, anything that shows up next year is going to show up. And you actually answered the second part of the question is what had to do with what if they um, move the money to, you know, have the grandparents put money in their name for them 
how does that work? And then the other question is, if a parent has unpaid student loans, does this affect the amount of financial aid their child can qualify for? Yeah, unfortunately, no, it doesn't affect it because they, they don't, I mean, they take debt into some of the EFC, but, but not really. Is on, is it, Wouldn't that be more of a fortunately no? <laughs> well, no, no, no. I mean that, that having student, having any kind of debt, right, isn't really a factor on the EFC. It, there's a limited amount that they, the formula is going to allow for. Mm -hmm. And that's the percentage, and then that's what it's calculated at. If you have, you know, out, you know, huge amount of outstanding debt, they're not going to care. They, you know, it's it's, it's they're not going to factor it beyond the, the level of the formula. Okay. And I started an account for my niece when she was a toddler that allows me to purchase portions of stock that hopefully are worth more when she is ready to go to college. It'll be worth less than ten thousand dollars when she goes to college. Pretty small money, but will this hurt her ability to get scholarships? So is it, the, the answer there would be, it depends on whose name it's in, right? If it's in her name. In her name for her name. Yeah, it doesn't say if it's in her name or not. I can't form my niece, but it doesn't say who the owner is, correct? Right. So if, uh, if it's in your name and you're just purchasing it and holding it until she gets there, it's in your name. It's never going to count against her because they don't know it exists. Again, you know, we'll asking this. about immediate family. Right. They don't. They don't include aunts and uncles in that calculation, right? Right. Or grandparents. Right. Right. No, only it's only parents and siblings basically get asked of on the financial aid application. Okay, I think we're clear to move forward. That's okay because we're going to go in through through some of this. So this is what the FAFSA form. It's this is the 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 student report looks like and tells you. And just giving you an example here because this is what Craig was talking about. So this is a couple where their adjusted gross income is two hundred ninety thousand dollars. Their expected family contribution is twenty nine thousand. But all of the schools that they applied to all had sticker prices of more than, you know, somewhere in the 80,000 range, you know, think Ivy League and those type of things. Like, you know, we, well, even Boston University now is, is up in that, that close to 80,000 range, right? So 80,000, that means the financial award that was probably going to be available to them through those institutions is going to be very significant. Mm -hmm. But just don't think, like Craig said, he sort of stressed that, is don't think that just because you made or earned too much or have too much money, you shouldn't file for it. Because one of the other things, and that's one of the mistakes that comes up with this, you know, should be the number one on the list, is not filing. Because the other is the only way to get the subsidized, the Stafford loans, those, those subsidized uh, student loans, is through FAFSA. So even if you're doing nothing more than I'm, I'm pushing off, you know, the 5,500 a year for four years, well, there's 20,000. I'm not taking out of my pocket to pay for education today. The only way to get that is by filing for FAFSA. All right. All right. So let's go to that, that minefield, the, the admission scandal part of all of this in terms of it. So... So here are some tips and tricks, and these are the ones to really, you know, to be thinking about as, I, as you're applying and thinking about schools. One, demonstrate an interest. By that, like Craig had mentioned, it's not so much an interest in your school, but an interest in the school you want to be attending. It's set up to go for a visit. Craig has talked about that. He's, he's doing, you know, multiple visits with his daughter as she's looking at schools. I will tell you, you know, follow them on Twitter, follow them, you know, on, on Facebook or wherever they are, you know, you know, things that show that you're interested in the school, that you, you want to be a part of their community. I will tell you, however, there are some schools who are not going to care in the least. Mainly they're Harvard on this coast, Stanford on the West Coast. You can figure out the, the schools that are like that. They don't. Harvard's never going to care if you go visit their campus. But most of the other colleges and universities, it, it means something to them. And well, even if they're not, go ahead. I would say, actually, sometimes when you visit the campus, they'll waive the cost of the application, your application fee. 
Yeah, there's another thing, saving money on that, because those add up, especially when we're talking about 10 schools, you know, suddenly that becomes an over, you know, a really expensive process to go through. dollars or more, right. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. But so that is another thing. But it also, you know, if they come, if you have, uh, you know, a lot of times they'll come to to school, right, they'll do a college fair, or they'll have, you know, somebody will come visit, just, you know, spend a couple of minutes with them. If, even if the SAT and ACT is not being required, take it anyway. It just shows that you want to take it. If you're able to, if you're able to do that, you know, do, you take the time and, and take that. Apply to a broad range of schools. And when I say a broad range, I mean, everybody has, I know I can get into this school. I more than likely am going to be able to get into that school. And then I've got the I reach school that, you know, there's probably no way that they're ever going to take a student like me. That's what I mean by a broad range. You should have, yeah, 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 the easy ones that I, that I know I can probably get into. I got the ones that I really want to try to get to. And then maybe like one or two reach schools. You know, again, going back to the example, just so you know, Harvard is a reach for everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. That's a reach school for everybody. Uh, join, you know, Craig just he talked about that, about, uh, you know, having um, showing an interest, being a part of whether it's an organization or a club or something at school. You know, one of the things we hear a lot is people say, you know, you got to do sports to be part of that. No, that's not what they're looking for. Like if robotics is your thing or chess is your thing, join that club, be part of it. That's all they're looking for is that you're an engaged student and you're bringing something as a an engaged student well the next they, one go ahead they also want to know that you know you have a high rate of you know completion like you are probably going to finish uh, you know your degree at that school and when they see involvement you know the more involvement they see the more involved you know they, they assume you're you're going to have a better success record yeah, absolutely. You know, the next one is very important because it's more important for the younger generation than it is for like Craig and I, because we're old dudes in terms of that. But it's manage your online reputation. So understand more and more admissions people are going to look at your online profiles. If you've got Facebook, if you're on Instagram or what it, whatever the other madness is out there, the TikTok thing or whatever that is, right? You know, if you've if you're posting, if you've got some, just understand they're looking at it. So make sure that you, you know, aren't doing anything crazy on that. And this Oprah one I know say, I make. Mean, right? Would Oprah say, don't post anything you wouldn't want your mother reading? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Pictures, anything, right? So just understand it's important. Uh, the next one I know it's going to make every student who's on here groan, but. Involve your parents in the process. Parents, make sure you're involved with the student. Like I said, it's got to be a collaborative effort. It's got to be a con conversation about what makes sense. What do you think is going to work? What's the best interest? And some of this also then comes down to pricing and cost. Like, hey, when we see all of this together, right, you know, school A is going to cost us 10000 a year and school B is going to cost us 30000 a year. You know, is there really that much significantly of a difference that it's worth $80,000 over four years to us to have you go to B versus A? Mm -hmm. And you need to be thinking about that and what that bottom line is. Uh, write a strong personal statement that goes along with the essay. That's just about who you are as a person, what you bring, what you mean. It's a it's a big impact to it. And then the last one there is getting organized. Like I said, if you're going to be going to school or in school next year, then FAFSA needs to be filed now. You need to know what those deadlines are. You need to know when, when you need to apply for school, what they're looking for, whether that's an essay, whether that's recommendations, all of that stuff. Your guidance counselor, student counselors can help with that in terms of putting all of that together. But a, a lot of this falls on the student, but parents, you should be involved as well. You know, it's one thing to say, hey, I'm letting them do it. But, you know, sort of check in with them to make sure that they know and you've got an idea of when all of those deadlines on eligibility and what they need to file are. So you just got to remember, you're trying to do everything you possibly can to put yourself in the best light possible. So when they see your application, it stands out. Absolutely.
All right. And so, you know, for us, basically what we do for everybody is, you know, we want to make sure everybody is in that best light, as Craig just said, and, and doing the best you can. One of the things we make available to anybody who goes through one of these presentations, we have a guidebook that goes along with it that is to save thousands on the cost of a college education. We'd make that available to anybody who's on the webinar today. The other part of that is that we also offer an opportunity to do a, it's no cost, no, you know, it's a complimentary consultation and there's no obligation there's no cost for it we do it as a give back as part of our doing a webinar and really all you got to do is drop yes in the chat box and we will get you out the guide and if you want to have a conversation with us we can do that i know uh either denise or or someone was going to drop our contact information in there you know, just believe, the, you yeah just also the, uh, scheduler as well yep. This is Craig and I in our more formal attire when we are out and about that, you know, generally sometimes you may see us at, at conferences or events. Mm -hmm. Yes, those are TB12 jerseys, but they're custom to us. And let's face it, he's the greatest of all time. So we're still wearing our Patriot, our Tom Brady jerseys, uh, mainly because we can't find Mac Jones jerseys anywhere yet. So we're still wearing the goat until he retires and then we'll figure it out from there. But that's us in our more, more formal attire, as I like to say. Uh, and that's pretty much what we had. Uh, Craig, any other questions or anybody have any questions for us? We're happy to, to hang out and answer questions and, and go through that. I have one is, is a savings bond in a student's name looked upon as income for EFC purposes? No, it's looked, it, it, it is one of those that's there as an asset. Mm -hmm. So, but because depending on when it is, they're not really going to look at it. They're not really going to ask you, hey, what do you have in savings bonds? Right. That'd only be if you cash the bond in. Correct. Then it would show up. Mm -hmm. That's one of those deferred, again, it's a deferred instrument, so they're not going to look at it. Okay.